Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? All right. Obviously, I am not Jonathan Bickham. Um, I'm not quite that handsome. Um, I would just want to say welcome to everybody online, and if you would stand with us, we're gonna 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 worship the Lord. From the waves crashing over every day, God of mercy, please come rescue me. I am longing for your voice, gentle whisper in the north, Father, tell me. to see y'all. I just have a couple announcements. My name is Paul Valdez. I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome to Fellowship Church. If you've never been here before, oh, and good morning to those of you online. Um, if you've never been here, we do have some welcome folders in the foyer that tell you a little bit more about Fellowship Church and our family here. Another way that you can learn more about us is through Discover Class, which will take place in a couple of Sundays from today, and you can sign up by filling out this portion of the bulletin here. It's perforated. 
and uh, drop it in one of the offering boxes. But we'd love to have you uh, join us. That takes place during third service, and we provide lunch. And children's ministry is also available for you. So how many of you last week um, came to Refuge? Seventh and eighth graders in, in the house? Oh, we have some leaders here. Any seventh and eighth graders? Are they up yet? How about ninth and tenth graders? Yeah, do we have any ninth and tenth graders? So ninth and tenth grade will be meeting this week here at on Wednesday for Refuge at 7 o'clock. We're excited. The rest of you, we'd love for you to join in online, but this is an exciting time for Refuge to start getting back together as they slowly as they move through the week. So all be back here in the house worshiping together. But this week, just keep in mind, ninth and 10th grade. I want to remind you, too, if you have any prayer requests, please fill this out, and you can drop them off in one of the offering boxes. We have our prayer warriors that meet throughout the week, and they are lifting you up. Let's, let's stand. Let's continue to worship as, uh, as I pray for us. Father God, we thank you for being in our lives, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the love that you have for us. Lord, uh, by your Spirit, we are here, and we're so grateful to be able to uh, worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we ask that you would just move about in our midst, and, and let us just rejoice and be glad in this day that you have made. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
on the promise and everybody began to breathe out of the silence
Father God, we just come before you today. We bow our hearts. We bow our heads. And we take a few minutes to listen to your divine whisper. Speak to our hearts today. Speak through Chris. Speak through music. Speak through the power of the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKadosh. Let us receive what you have for us. And we already give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what you are doing today. Change our hearts, O God, as you remind us that your loving kindness is better than life. Amen. You may be seated. Reading from Mark, Chapter 2, when he, Jesus, had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, being unable to get to him because the crowd, they because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they dug an opening, they let him down on the pallet which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, Your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God and God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sons are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Bless the reading of God's Word. Amen. How are you guys doing out there? Good? You all excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Man, 
I am, I am, and sometimes we get back into routine of life, school starting, well, kind of, school starting, school on the screen starting, schoolology, all these kind of new words being invented. But as we get back into the routine of things, we can forget how good God is for us, what he has done for us, taking us through all of these different things that are going on. And so um, one of the things I have to tell you, man, I feel, felt a little bad this week because when we were speaking last week in this series called Prepared, one of the things that we did was we talked about our backpacks. And we talked about what it meant for us to unpack our mind and our heart because sometimes we, we forget that we, and we leave stuff in there. It's kind of dirty and nasty and stinky. And I forgot to tell you how hard that is to do. I forgot to tell you how hard it really is to let God in to penetrate the deepest areas of our hearts and our minds because it's hard to deal with some of those things. It really is. And we know that with meekness, we're balancing this confidence we have in the Lord with humility. But man, the enemy can beat us up sometimes. And so as we talk about today, getting a helper, someone to help us be able to clean out our backpack, right? We just want to give that to the Lord. I encourage you this week as we struggle through, as we walk through this world and this life to keep digging in because we're on a journey with Jesus Christ. And we want to walk step by step, just as he walks, to be with him. And so in order to do that, I want to introduce you to one of my, my helpers and my friends. This is Moses. He's a stick, okay? This is my friend. So I nicknamed him Moses because he delivered his people, right? When we were hiking through the mountains and people were tripping or falling or going across the river, I'd, I'd stick the hook out there and i help him across. And so this is my friend Moses. I picked him up one mile into my first hiking trip up in Colorado. I cut a couple pictures with Moses. Well, and my friend Mitch, and he's there too. But this is really me and Moses up there uh, taking a picture, right? Here's another picture of us up on the mountains. We've been in some incredible places together, uh, Moses and I. Moses, when I first picked him up, um, right after we had gotten off the train and we're starting our journey, um, he was a little rough around the edges. But if you were to feel him now, he is smooth. From 120 miles of walking, Moses and I have been together, hand and in, in stick. I don't know, he doesn't have a hand, but hand and stick together. We've walked 120 miles. That's like walking from here to Waco or here to College Station to give you a little reference in that. Um, we've been through a lot of different things. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you we had a few conversations over the time. I mean, one of the reasons I love this stick is because he can turn and talk to me, and sometimes he gets mad at me, and he turns away, you know. I have a very vivid imagination if you didn't know that, right? Um, and there's definitely been times I've been like, I can't make it, Moses. I can't. He's like, get off me, right? And so I'm like, okay. So there's definitely times that we've been walking, like, come on, man, we can do it. Almost there. And I, I don't know if you talk to your things. I'm not quite on Wilson level of castaway, but there's definitely times we have these conversations together, like, come on, just a couple more steps, a couple more as they're going through it. Uh, the bottom is really worn down and flat. And, man, I, he was sitting there by me and inside the tent. He got inside the tent with me. That, that's the relationship that we have over this time. And because we walked so many miles together, we really do have a bond. It was probably eight or nine years ago, the last time I took a journey. He's still in my office. He has a little spot in my office that he sits right there behind the chair. So if you were to come sit in my office and counseling, Moses is there with you right behind, just checking out everything. going Because when we go on this journey and this adventure together, we have these experiences, right? And when I see Moses, I'm reminded of God's creation. I think back to these pictures. That is a crazy place to be. That is not an easy place to get to. Right? There's snow, there's frozen lakes, there you can see for miles and miles and miles. And so as we, as believers in Christ, have more and more experience together, we're going to make those memories. And as we see, as I see Moses, I'm reminded of things. When I see someone like Eric Pruka, I'm reminded of the time that he got mad at me because we hiked into El Rocco and without his permission. But I still remember that. And whenever I see him, I have this common experience with him. We have all of these common experiences for one another, but what I want to encourage you today is you need a Moses. You need a, a, someone to walk the journey of life with you. Now, Moses doesn't talk back much, right? So it might be better for you to get a helper among the people in this room, 
someone that can walk that journey with you. What I'm talking about today is friends. And more than that, how do we have friends that bring us to Jesus? So that's our journey. So Moses, you're going to hang over here. Get it, literally. That was, a, that was a Jonathan joke, hang, okay? But we're going to go to Mark chapter 2. Turn there with me. I encourage you to take some notes along with us as we go. So we pick up in verse 1, and we see, and when he returned to Capernaum. Now remember last week, if you weren't here last week, you're just going to have to believe me. Last week we talked about Jesus in Capernaum, right? And he was in the synagogue and he was preaching and a man popped up that had an unclean spirit and Jesus was like, leave. And it's like, ah, ran out of there and he was healed, right? And then Jesus went outside and he was healing all kinds of people. Remember Peter's mother-in-law was there and, and he picked her up and she started serving him. And all these things were happening in Capernaum. Everybody was coming to Jesus. But then he woke up early in the morning and he went out to a solitary place he got away from everyone and everyone was looking for him he said my job is to preach the kingdom of God is at hand and so he left and then remember he encountered a leper in the next city and remember um, he said you can make me clean and he said I will and he put his hands upon him and he blessed him and this leper became clean praise the Lord right so Jesus is still walking around all these different cities in Galilee And he's continuing to, um, bye, see you later. It's okay, that's awesome. Um, He's continuing to walk around these cities, and now Jesus has returned, right? So it says, and when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, we don't know how long he was gone, it was reported that he was home. It spread through the village. Jesus is back. So if you were one of the people that were looking for healing when Jesus went to the solitary place and you were left disappointed, Jesus is back. You have a new opportunity for healing, a new opportunity to be made whole. And so they begin to just, Jesus is here, and they crowd around. And many were gathered together, so there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to him. Can you imagine, I want you to think about your house. How many people would it take to fill up your house? I mean, standing room only, or people are just sitting all over each other. I know most of you haven't been on youth trips, but this happens often on youth trips where we get stuck in a little room and we just make it work, right? So this is the everybody. I mean, think about this room. That would be a 1,000 people pushing this room. Now, Peter's house is probably not that big. But people are crowded. They're looking in the windows. They're finding any way to be able to hear what Jesus does. And what does Jesus do in this time? He preaches the word to them. This is path group, original path group right here, home group, life group, whatever you want to say. Jesus took an opportunity to preach the word. So here's the first thing I want you to write down. If you're taking notes, write it with me. Right? Discussing the word of God is not just a Sunday thing. It wasn't, he wasn't in the synagogue. He took an opportunity to talk about and to preach the word of God as people were there to see him. Are we that way? If we want to be like Christ, that means that we naturally bring up Christ in our conversations as we go throughout the week, as we have opportunity. The easiest way to do that is for us to put the word of God in our hearts and our minds, right? We talked about a few weeks ago uh, that our memory and remembering the things of God were so important to us. Are you in the word daily? Because when you are, that's going to seep out of your life, right? And so it's going to come up naturally in conversations when you're at lunch or you're at work or those different things. And God can use you as a light of the world to people when you begin to bring him up in casual conversation. We're supposed to talk about him at church. When we bring him up in those casual conversations, that's when people begin to know that this is a truth coming from our heart. And here's Jesus, opportunity, preaching the word, right? And we know that. We want to be like Christ. We want to do the similar. And they came. Who's they? We're going to find out in a second. Bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So here's the picture. The house is crowded. Standing room only, a hundred people packed in your house, can't get in, and they bring their friend. He missed the opportunity some days ago to see Jesus. 
and they come, and it's crowded. And I'm sure they were asking if they could get in. No one wanted to let them in. This is Jesus talking. And so in Jewish culture, the roof was kind of like an open second story. It was generally flat. Um, their houses were mud packed. So if you've ever been to Honduras with us, you understand what this means. They, they put up beams or branches, and they just take mud, and they start packing it around. That's how they would make their, their homes. And so the roof was similar. They had beams that went across, and they packed in the middle, this mud and this, this earthen material to make their roof. And they would have things on the roof that they would lay out to dry or lay out for their food, and it was a storage area. So they probably had a staircase that went up to the roof because it was a usable place. But these friends take him up to the roof, and they begin to dig. They look at the beams, they find in between, they begin to dig. Now imagine, right now, if someone was on the roof of the church and started ripping the metal off, Right now, I mean, it's just falling, earth, dirt, falling all over you. Are you staying? I mean, think about it. Over your head, stuff starts falling off the roof. What are y'all doing? Y'all are out of here, right? Y'all are like, I mean, y'all love me and all, but y'all are gone. Like something is happening up there, right? So these people are packed in this room. Dirt's falling on their head. They're just ripping through the roof. And what was their goal? To get their friend to Jesus. Guys, find friends like this. Amen? Find friends that will dig through the roof to get you to the feet of Jesus. But here's the second part. Be a friend. Be a friend like this. You see, we all look for those friends, but what if we all started to be that friend? What if we were the ones to carry our friends to the feet of Jesus? We tend to be friends that try to solve problems and help each other out, which is awesome. But really, as friends, our job is to help lead people to the foot of the cross where they can get whole again. So, so what does it mean for us to be a good friend? Here's something we see in this picture. They don't ever give up. If you want to be a good friend, don't give up on your friends. Stick through the hard times. Stick through the things that don't go exactly according to plan. Be committed to one another. Don't give up. Here's the second thing, and this is in the scriptures. This is just in general. Hey, we need to listen. We probably need to listen more than we talk, right? James 119 talks about that. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, right? So that's probably just a good general rule of friendship. Listen to one another. By the way, are friendships easy or hard? Hard. Friendships are hard aren't they? So question, if it's hard, should we still do it? Oh, I thought that God was going to open a door and open a window and it's going to be really easy in there. If, if, if anyone's told you that being a Christian is easy, they lied to you. It's just not. We're walking with Jesus. The world is not in love with Jesus. We hope they do. God of revival, bring it on down. We hope that through this time that God brings about a revival but we want to walk with Jesus. It's hard. You've got to walk with your friends. It's going to be hard. Guys, ease doesn't ever help you get deeper. You've got to break through the surface in order to get deeper with people. So don't let ease be an excuse. You know what ease does? It makes you lazy. Hard work is what's going to accomplish things in your life. If you want to be a good friend, work at it. I mean, think about it. Anybody heard this phrase, choose joy? Before anybody tell yourself that? I do a lot. Choose joy, right? Why do we use that phrase so much? Because it's not our default. If it was easy to choose joy, we wouldn't have to have the saying. We choose joy because it's hard. We've got to step into that joy. And here's the last one. Create C's. Now, I've been a youth pastor for a long time. And so one of the things that happens in youth groups a lot of times, we have what's called cliques. Have you heard of that before? A click, right? This is a, just a group of friends that is really close. And as adults, we don't have cliques. We don't, we don't have that anymore. We have tribes. <laughs> same word, same thing, right? We just have a different word for it, right? And so what I want to encourage you to do today is to create a C. Here's what I mean. If you have a group of friends, when you're talking together, you tend to make a circle, right? Where you kind of get together and you're all facing each other. But if you're that person on the outside walking up to the circle, you don't want to like nuzzle your way into the circle. 
right? If it's a circle, you're probably just going to walk on to the next one. So here's what I do all the time in youth group is I always create a C. So I get in the circle and then I open up to invite other people into the conversation. Let's get personal. After this, who are you going to talk to after church today? Your tribe? I mean, you see them throughout the week. You see them at Path Group. You see them at these other places. Who are you going to talk to when you get done with church? Are you going to talk to the people that you don't know? Are you going to introduce yourself? Awkward, right? But isn't that church? I mean, think about this. You didn't always know your friends. You had to get to know them at some point. So how about let's open up our circles, invite people in, and have conversations with people that you've seen at church but you never have talked to them. They're people too, right? Go talk to one another. Encourage one another. In fact, when we celebrate, Frank here, he's going to get baptized after the service, and we go out and celebrate. It's a chance for us to just have a great time celebrating. Whoever you end up standing next to you, say hi. Invite them in. Here's the last thing. You, you, you confessed to me a second ago that friendship was hard. Here's the last key point. You have to forgive. If you want to be a good friend, you have to forgive one another because as you live life together, you're going to hurt each other's feelings. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. How quick are you to forgive? Let me give you an example from my own life. When I was in um, college, my best friend was named David Payton. Um, he was just an awesome guy. He was the one who led me to the Lord when I was in 10th grade. Just an awesome dude. We lived together. We went to Southwest Texas State University, now known as Texas State. But, you know, we had that really long acronym back in the day. And so David was an awesome guy. And so if you've been in Southwest Texas, you know it's different now than it used to be. There used to be a field back by Blanco Hall that was like the intramural field. But every time it rained, it would turn into like this mud pit. And so every time it rained, like when it rained hard, a bunch of us guys would show up there to play football, to relive the glory days, right? Because there's nothing better than playing football and like falling in the mud where it doesn't hurt quite as bad, right? Now, I had a, a particular advantage because I played college football, and my friends were all Baptist Student Union engineers and music pastors and people like that, right? So I loved it because I was like the man, right? But this particular day, it rained like crazy. We we're out there, and we we're having a great time, but I was getting owned. My team, we we're playing three on three, and I could not catch a break. I mean, no one would catch a pass. It was, just, it was just ugly. We were losing by like two touchdowns. And if you didn't know me, I'm slightly competitive. Like just slightly. It's like a little bit competitive in those things. And, and that's the now. Back then, I was like ultra like competitive in that. So I went full Ray Lewis mode, right? And like if you're a football guy, you know what Ray Lewis mode is. Basically, I went into flashback to football in front of fans, and my friend, about 140 pound, Walter Teeter, please forgive me, Walter, if you're watching online, okay? He's running down the sideline, and I just go full lit him up. I mean, I just went full like boom, and he flew through the air into the mud, and I was just like, I took out all of my frustration in one thing. That's bad. Don't do that. Or don't follow your pastor's example in that. It was bad. I mean, I just destroyed him. Because, you know, when you play football with your friends, you, like, tackle them and, like, fall down, right? You don't really tackle people, you know, but I just full-on lit him up. Well, my best friend, my BFF forever, right, he comes charging at me. He's going to defend his friend. He comes fist going. Now, in my mind, this is like UFC, right? I'm like spin kicking, and I'm like, but in actuality, it was like a, it's like a man hug, right? We just running like, ah, we don't know how to fight. We don't know anything. So he runs, and I'm like, close my eyes, and I swing, and we hit each other, and we like wrestle. For, it was like nothing, right? We, we don't know how to fight. We just kind of like, oh, got mad and stormed off. He rode with me. I don't know how I got home, because I was out of there. Like, I just said, whatever I said at that point, and just left, right? Ugh, best friends, gone. One play. A couple hours later, he called me up. Hey, do you want your ball back? Yeah, he's like, hey, bring, bring your basketball down. We play, two hours later, we're playing basketball outside. He's like, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. He's like, oh, me, me too. You know. And then we laughed about it. Because we didn't hold a grudge, 
we actually got out all of our frustration that one moment and we were able to forgive one another. If that happened in your life, would you be able to forgive? It's hard. It's hard, right? It's hard to forgive when we mess up and, and we, we have these fights with one another. It's hard. Okay, sorry. Let me get more personal. Who is your best friend? Husbands? Should be your spouse. Let's look at this list again, right? Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up. Listen. If marriage was easy, there would be no divorce rate. Marriage is not easy. If someone told you it was easy, they're lying to you, right? Invite other people in to help you walk through your marriage with you. Learn from people that have done it well. Ask them, hey, how did you get that far? I feel trapped in these things, right? And forgive one another just as Christ forgave us. It's hard, but we can do it if we want to be like Christ. So be a good friend to the people in your house, the people that you go into community with. Be a good friend. These guys were good friends. They, they rip the roof open. They lay him down at Jesus' feet. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, and when Jesus saw their faith, their faith to bring him, they just, all they want to do is, can I get my friend to Jesus? Jesus answered their prayer and said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, let's be honest. If you're the friends, you're disappointed with this answer. Why did you bring your friend to Jesus so he would be healed? Was he healed here? Yes. Internal, right? Eternal healing. But it wasn't exactly what they wanted. So, but Jesus throws this out there. Son, your sins are forgiven. And then... The scribes freak out. Look what it says next. And now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So, so here's what's going on in the scribes' mind, right? They're saying, who is this that says he can forgive sins? Does he think he's God? Now, I don't know if you understand this, but out in the world, as people begin to question Christianity and begin to question your faith, they're going to say, guys, Jesus never claimed to be God. In fact, there's a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. If you haven't listened to it or read it, you should read it by a guy named Nabil Qureshi. Now, Seeking Allah, he was a Muslim, but then his friend just kept loving him and loving him, and he turned and he gave his life to Christ through years and years of questioning and questioning. And one of the major things that the Muslim faith says against Christianity is that Jesus never claimed to be God. Why didn't he just say it? I want to, I want to prove to you today that he did. When someone asks me this question, this is the text that I go to to say, look at what Jesus does and says in this picture. Did the scribes think he was claiming to be God? Yes, because what did they accuse him of? Blasphemy, right? So let's go through some logic, okay? Let's go through some logic. For example, how many of y'all like geometry? Anybody like geometry out there? Okay, how many people do not? I got a boo from the back, right? <laughs> wow, okay. Now, geometry should be the best math out there. I taught algebra and geometry for like 17 years. And people, because it's shapes, right? It's circles, it's triangles, it's, it's kites and all kinds of cool shapes. But you know why everybody hates geometry? Proofs. Proofs. Some of y'all said it with me. You knew it right away. You're like, proofs. I hate those things. Given this, prove this. And you got to memorize postulate 4.6 or this theorem or this thing, right? You have all these things you got to memorize. You have that little dumb chart and you got to put it all in there and it's just tedious. Well, Jesus is going to do a proof right here for you using some logic, okay? So here's the first logic statement I want you to, to see if you agree with, okay? Only God can forgive sin. Only God can forgive sin. In fact, only God can heal the broken. This was a tenet of the Jewish faith at this time. Now, in order to prove this, we got to go to the Old Testament because that was the scripture they had that these scribes were judging him upon. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Look at um, Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit 
there is no deceit. Who's counting the iniquity? God is, right? Look in Isaiah chapter 43, uh, verse 25, I think it is. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. This is God speaking. I am the one who forgives your sins for my own sake. I am the one who doesn't count your iniquities against you. Second Chronicles seven fourteen, a really famous verse talking about the things that we should do in order to heal our land. But look what it says in there. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. So God is the one who forgives sin. Old Testament was their proof for that. So here's the second point of our logic. If we know that is true about God, then here's the second thing that they believed, that only God could heal sin, but he wouldn't listen to sinners. He, he listened to the people of God. He didn't listen to sinners. He didn't heal sinners. He didn't listen to sinners. This is why Christ first forgave his sin and then healed him. Because he made him whole spiritually, and then he made him whole physically. And it fit the Jewish pattern here. Now we see this, um, the best picture I have of this is in John chapter 9. So turn there um, with me to John chapter 9. I want to read a bunch of scripture to you, because I think it's just a fascinating um, story that John records. In this passage, I want you to see these themes coming forward. Does God... Listen to sinners. Here's what it says in verse 1 of John chapter 9. And he, being Jesus, passed by and he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So do you see what the belief coming in? This person was born blind. Something's wrong. Who sinned, him or his parents? Why was God punishing him? You see, that that's bad theology, right? This is bad thinking. In fact, um, Exodus 4 says that God creates the handicapped for his glory. That there aren't accidents, there aren't mess-ups, that God creates the Down syndrome kid for his glory and for his beauty because there's beauty in those people. So this person is born blind. It's not because they're sin or they're not dirty or unworthy. They still have worth. In this society, they didn't have worth because their sin, remember back to Job, just curse God and die. You're sick because you must have had sin. He's like, no, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we see that same picture here, and Jesus answered, um, it is not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Guys, this man was blind for years and years and years so that God could bring him back his sight to bring God glory. Maybe God has a purpose for the struggles you're in. For his glory. It might be a while till you see it, but that's why we never tire of doing good. That's why we continue to persevere and have endurance, right? And so he says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud. Now, if, you were, if I were to spit in the mud and rub it on your eyes, you wouldn't call it anointed. I'm just saying. Now, Jesus did it, and he says he anointed his eyes with mud. You know, God doesn't always work exactly like we think he's going to work there. Um, so he spit there, and he said, um, Go, wash in the pool of Shalom, that it might be sin, which means sin. So he went, and he washed, and came back seeing. And the neighbors, and those that had seen him before as a beggar, were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. But others said, No, but he's kind of like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, Then how were your eyes open? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud, and he anointed my eyes. And he said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. I mean, he just got, he's just able to see. He doesn't want to go. I mean, like, man, y'all leave me alone so I can look around and see. I haven't seen anything for, for 40 years. Let me look around. But they keep asking him. And then they bring him to the Pharisees. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day. 
when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. He keeps telling the story, right? Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. Their, their beliefs are getting rocked right here. They're like, how, how do we process this thing that has happened? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. How could a man do this without God's help? But on the other side, they're going, but he's breaking the rules. Jesus always prioritizes relationships over rules. In fact, they didn't understand the fulfillment of the law as Jesus understood the fulfillment of the law, that a Sabbath wasn't for a rule, but the Sabbath was for man. And he had a purpose in these different things. And he was redefining the way we think of things. But guys, in your life, make relationship a priority over things. That means the relationships that are in your home, in your workplace, are worth it to take a break and build. It's worth it to take a break from that project or from this email or from this meeting in order to build relationship. That's why kids crying in church doesn't bother me at all. I mean, it's a chance for a relationship with Troy over there, snuggling over there, right? It's a, it's a chance. We have distractions in the world. We have to focus through them, right, in the same way. And so we see that here, that they're just questioning, okay, they're in total disarray. What do we do? How can this man be doing these things? And, and there's division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. And the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son whom you say was born blind? How then does he, see, he now see? And his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know nor do we know who has opened his eyes. Again, ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And that's why they said, ask him. Guys, these are not the friends you want. The ones that are going to be in fear of the world and they're not going to profess Jesus because they're scared of the things that are happening, even though their son has been made whole, they shrink away from it, right? And so a second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. The one thing you know is your testimony. Go tell it. You may not know all the answers, but man, I don't know. But here's what I, he's done for me. And go tell your story, right? And he said, I, you know, I don't know, but he did it, right? And they reviled him. Oh, let me go back. And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to also become his disciples? Bad answer, right? And they reviled him. They, they would literally spit at him and say, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, this is an uneducated man, and he answers them just from the power of God. He says, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he, if anyone worship, is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began had it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And of course, they didn't like that answer, right? And they answered him, you were born into utter sin and, would not te and you would teach us. And they cast him out, right? What an amazing testimony. But do you see what's happening here? They're in this turmoil because they're like, well, God doesn't listen to sinners, but yet Jesus is doing all these miraculous things. And so when we get back into Mark chapter 2, this is the dilemma for the scribes. He said, your sins are forgiven. That's blasphemy. 
And so Jesus uses this belief system, this logic that they've had before to say, listen, if I tell this guy to stand up and walk, I'm God. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to tell this man to get up and walk? And I'm imagining Jesus, just, that awkward silence. Which is easier? And looking at him. One is an internal change. One is a right-in-your-face external change. And he's just looking at him. But look what he says next, right? He says, which is easier? And he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So, so that you will know that I have the authority from God to say this, he says to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them. And so they were all amazed, glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Again, remember, put yourself in the scene. Someone who's never walked before, who's had to be lowered down, who's been on a mat, has been begging for money for years and years and years, gets up and walks out. That's the power of God. That's the miracle of God. This is God at work. Why? Because I have the power to forgive sin. Let me show you. Boom. Gets up and walks. Jesus is God. Do you believe that? I mean, otherwise you just kind of came here for fun, I guess, on a Sunday morning, right? You didn't sleep in, you know, whatever. But we believe Jesus is God. So why don't we go to him for help when our mind is wrong and our heart is wrong? Why don't we go to him? Well, sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need friends to say, hey, have you talked to Jesus lately? Hey, have you, have you been talking to him? Have you listened to his word? Have you thought about this verse? Have you, have you done these things? We need friends around us that are going to push us back to Jesus. We need to be friends that sometimes have to say the hard word to people. You know, Dan is here today. Um, praise the Lord. He was in the hospital a few weeks ago, and I got to visit Dan in the hospital. So I don't know if you, um, I don't know how you imagine a pastoral visit to a hospital. I don't know if you imagine, like, we just come in, and we're just, like, reading scripture the whole time to him. But you have to remember, like, I'm kind of new at this, and then I'm also an old coach, right? And so I just kind of gave it to Dan. Like, we're sitting there, I'm like, dude, get off your tail. Get up and walk. What are you doing? And that, that's not usually the thing you say to people when they're sick. For Dan, right, we knew it. And I said, I had to kind of kick him in the, the tush. Is that an acceptable word in church? Okay, tush. I had to kick him in the tush, right, to get him moving again, right? Because that's what Dan needed. He needed to be pushed to do something different than he was doing. He was in the Word. He was reading the Word. He was praying. But he needed someone to give him that kick into what God need, wanted him to do. It's like, get up and walk, right? Just like this says, get up and walk, right? And God did some incredible things that he's here today to read scripture to you. Praise the Lord. That's a testimony to God. Yeah, praise the Lord. That's awesome, All right? And there's other times that we pray faithfully, and we end up having funerals here. But we pray in faith, because for every celebration, there's hard things, and we just continue to have faith and trust in God through those things. But here's my encouragement. Surround yourself with people that are going to take you to the foot of the cross, don't surround yourself with yes men. Don't surround yourself with people that are just fun all the time. Surround yourself with people that will push you towards being like Jesus. We all need it. We all need someone to tell us, like, hey, keep going. You can make it. We need it. Let's pray. Lord, let's come before you thankful for who you are. That, Lord, you don't let us um, sit in our sin. That, Lord, you want us to bring those things before you. That you are in the business of making us new. You're in the business of forgiveness. You have been that perfect example for us, Lord. And I see just what a beautiful picture, Lord, of you sitting in the house teaching people about the word. And, Lord, as things come through the roof, you faithfully love and forgive and heal. Lord, do that to our hearts. Help us to forgive ourselves. Help us to be healed of these things that have gone wrong in our lives or these things that have been wrong done to us, Lord. Help us to put those things at the foot of the cross and to trust you in all of those things. Lord, I thank you so much for who you are, that we can walk side by side with you on this journey. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hey, Brandon. Hello. Wow, man. What an opportunity it's been to worship the Lord with you, to be able to um, dive into the book of Mark with Chris. I have two things before I dismiss y'all. Um, one is uh, outside, there, we have a table with some of the study books. If you want to follow along a little bit deeper throughout the week in the book of Mark, take those. Those, those are for you. Um, make us print more of them. We want y'all to be in the Word this week following along with the prepared series. And the second thing is, man, we want to invite you out there. Uh, Frank Martinez is going to be baptized. Um, and so uh, we want you to join us out there. Um, if you're online, thank you for coming. Um, you have like two minutes to get here to see the baptism. So, uh, but we love you guys. We're still going to dismiss, but we want you all to be able to make your way to the front. So uh, y'all are dismissed. If uh, you're on this section, you can head out this door. This section, you can go out with Josh Clark there. In the middle, you can go out the center. So we love you guys. Have a great week. So how